So we're going to look at William Blake. Let's try this again. William Blake today as the first of our romantic poets. And um, with that, a sort of introduction into um, romantic poetry in general. But there is a, as I said last time, there are significant differences between the poets, although they have also certain common features, which is what allows us to call them the romantic poets and uh, or even a romantic movement and there's a significant transformation I, i'm going to emphasize on the course the effect in poetry it's a course in romantic poetry but you could see a similar sort of transformation that we see in, in the poetry of the period in other of the arts um, uh, in music with Beethoven, in uh, philosophy with Immanuel Kant. Um, Immanuel Kant's philosophy is often seen as the beginning of modern philosophy by some people's lights because of his so-called Copernican revolution, seeing if the world conforms to our capacities to perceive it rather than existing as an objective entity out there. In the, his, his first critique, the critique of pure reason, he talks in those terms. Um, so there's re there are revolutionary um, things going on in multiple artistic fields. I talked uh, a fair bit about the politics last time uh, because we often tend to associate things with politics and that is particularly if we're influenced by the Marxists who uh, tend to place greater weight on politics and on um, the uh, enterprise of politics, which they also reduce to um, material things, you know, gaining wealth and so forth. I think there's a lot more to politics than that, but um, the, re the reductionist uh, materialism of the Marxist is very influential. Even when we're looking at things culturally, there's a tendency to do that. Um, and as I say, the course is on poetry, but I at least just want to mention that there are in other fields uh, this similar sorts of revolutionary uh, changes going on, at least in the arts. Um, the, let me say something about the term romantic as well. It's um, notice, uh, notably slippery. Not clear why it actually uh, is called that. They didn't call themselves that. Uh, so Wordsworth and his friends were called the Lake Poets. Um, Byron and Shelley and Keats were sometimes called the satanic school. Um, uh, we don't tend to use those descriptions uh, we, and we unite the two. Um, note that the former is pretty uh, placid and complementary and not very threatening and the secondary obviously the exact opposite. Um, and it, it, again, is associated to some degree with the politics. Uh, but I think that you can see greater commonalities there than are often recognized, and so I'm going to see them take them together. Um, and the diversity of the period is, um, we'll demonstrate when we look at the various poets. But as I say, the unifying factors are going to be the, the, the main emphasis, uh, which is why we're taking them together. Um, it is probably a reaction against various things. It is the neoclassical poetics of the 18th century. Uh, and I, I talked about that in the introductory class. Uh, the, and, and in particular, the subject matter of neoclassical poetry. But even the style, neoclassical poetry tends to be written in rhyming couplets. We, associate it, we tend to associate that with Alexander Pope you know, the great exponent of that. Uh, but that, it doesn't begin with Pope. Uh, Milton is railing against rhyme in uh, when he writes Paradise Lost, saying, you know, no great poet of, of old was uh, forced to restrict himself to rhyme in order to write his poetry, so I'm going to write unrhymed verse and not be enslaved to uh, a system of poetry, which is, uh, in Milton's words, a barbarism. The barbarism held for a long time and was held to be classical um, from the time of uh, the classical 
uh, great classical poets like Ben Jonson and so forth in the early 17th century. But uh, Milton wanted to throw that off. And it had overtones um, uh, at odds with neoclassical conventions so, uh, or values even, things like uh, rational order and regularity and uh, generalizations, you know, types. Uh, the Romantics, um, to some degree, lean towards um, the romance, the literary genre of the romance, um, which you would know best through King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. So they're episodic tales, uh, but without the grand sweep of the epic itself. So the various, you know, from remember Sir Gowan the Green Knight, we did it in first year, but we, you could look at, if you looked at uh, Mallory's Mar Mort d'Arthur and so forth, there are individual stories about individual knights. Supernatural can be there, but it isn't, there isn't a sense of an over, uh, overarching, compelling meta-narrative in there. They're episodic, supernatural does intervene, but there isn't a sense of uh, a, a dominant unifying theme in the stories. Uh, same thing in the Romantic period. There tends to be a, a strong sense of the, of the supernatural uh, without connecting it to explicitly to God. Uh, it is interesting that in English, the, uh, we see the rise of the novel in the 18th century. In French and in German, they call that the Roman, R-O-M-A-N, the Roman. And it's because the, um, whereas the novel is a novel form. Uh, in both cases, there's a newness, but in the, in the sense in French and in German and uh, I think in Italian, uh, but other languages, uh, a sense of a return to medieval ways of thinking as opposed to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. So it's an attempt, it's, there's a perception that the Enlightenment's rationalism is reductionistic and they want to get back to a period prior to that reductionism. Same thing we can see in painting um, that's here in, in the, the so-called pre-Raphaelite painters. Do you know the pre-Raphaelites? I'll show you a couple, and then, and then you will immediately know. This comes after the Romantic period, but it, I think it contains the same sort of sentiment. Uh, images. There you go, look at all these. These look familiar? Lady of Shalott and all that. Right, these are hearkening to the, so no, they're notably episodes from medieval times and dealing with tragedy and an, an individual knight and a lady and there's a sort of a circumstance, but it's, it, it, note, note, it's not depicting Christian stories. It's stories of, of, of valor and knighthood, but also loss. And there's a poignancy to it. They're beautiful. And the, the pre-Raphaelites are writing in the middle of the Victorian period, not the Romantic. It's, this comes after that. But I, I still think there are some similarities there that we can uh, talk about uh, as characteristic of romantic sensibilities. You know, there's an element of mystery in life. And, uh, and largely, again, it's a rebellion against the idea of an over overly prescriptive, orderly, rationalistic, reductionist world. And they see that and they attribute that actually and will connect it even with Christianity, which is an odd thing. Because in general, the Enlightenment doesn't want to asso associate rationality with Christianity. In general, it's a sort of an anti particularly in French, it's a very anti-Christian movement. Uh, but cr Christianity forms the backdrop for many romantic stories, medieval monks and abbeys and 
ruins. So the Gothic novel is often set in an abbey or even, even with abbots and, and nuns and so forth doing scandalous things, murders being happening. So in the context of Christianity, there's non, very unchristian things happening. So it's irregular and it's wild in many ways. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, importance to those sorts of things. And um, so it's very, it's very much in opposition to classical then. Yeah, it can be expressed in other ways, uh, not just in terms of painting. I'm just trying to give you things for your mind's eye here. Uh, Turner is one of the sort of typical painters of the period. Uh, let's see if I can even, there is some. So Turner is associated with sublime painting. You can see that uh, often there's storms in the background and, the, and it's, um, and the background is very much the foreground of the painting. If you look at Renaissance painting, the subject matter is front and center and in a very typical triangular shape. There's a sort of a classical Madonna holding the baby and her arms are out. And th there's a triangle there and the baby's right in the center, but it's front and center. That's the focus of the painting. Uh, in romantic painting, our attention is drawn to the background of the painting. And rather than light and, and color, we often get gloominess and mystery and murkiness. Gets further pushed uh, on after Turner in the Impressionist paintings. You know how it appears like it's a little spotty and hard to see. You know what I mean by Impressionist painting? So there's an emphasis on, on looking into things rather than at things, behind them even. So there's a, there's a, a, a gravitation towards mystery and that's reflected in the paint. It's easier to depict in painting, actually, in some ways. The music would, we'd have to go from, say, Bach to, uh, to Beethoven. And Beethoven is, I mean, maybe for you it's all the same, but it, it's very different, it's very much uh, explosive, breaking conventions and you know, the passion's overflowing. Uh, so this is one painting by Turner. Here's another one. This is Dido building Carthage, famous painting. Look at it, Dido's over here. This is about Dido building Carthage. Carthage is there, but where's the focus of the painting? It's right here down the center. It's looking down into the background. If you get a copy of the Aeneid, this is sometimes the copy that they use on it. Um, so it's a famous depiction of, of Turner. Dido's just over here on the, on the sideline, you can barely see her. The city is represented, but even the city is, uh, our eye is cast into the shadowy mist in the background. Typical of Turner's paintings, very much romantic in its emphasis. Again, the emphasis is, it's about Dido and Carthage, but actually, is it looking at Dido and Carthage? No, it's really looking at the background to that period. And I, I, I'm gonna submit to you that the Romantics in general are, are pushing us to think in the same sorts of ways. Looking in the background rather than the foreground. Uh, comments or questions at this point? So that's one, another illustration, we could do more. Note all, the in, note, note all the storms as well in Turner. Okay, well, I can leave it there for now for a second. Um, so again, the idea of getting behind that. Now, why is that? Why, why is there such a strong reaction against the rationalism and uh, the the classical decorum and ideals that come from the Renaissance, really. It's not just a reaction against the Enlightenment, it is the Renaissance and it, its ideals. Um, it's, it, too much is made of the Romantic movements pushing back against the Enlightenment. It is there, no doubt, and the scientific reductionism and so forth, but it's also in reaction against Renaissance classical ideals of order and propriety and decorum and measure and 
and proportion and, and uh, a sort of sense of, of, yeah, proportion I've already used, but uh, a sense of being in the, in the mean, right in the middle, finding the right place on that. It's, there is no such place. How come? Why the Romantics perceive it this way? It's largely because I'm going to submit the, the influence of John Locke. Now, John Locke, uh, for those of you who are philosophers, you may have looked at him. Um, we're not going to read Locke here, but Locke's influence uh, is significant over the whole period. If you read modern critics of the Romantic movement, they often will talk about Immanuel Kant and so forth. But the Romantics, by and large, with the exception of Coleridge and Shelley, didn't read Kant. They didn't read him, and he didn't influence them. They were influenced by another source, and that, that is Locke. Now, Locke we know for all sorts of things, but he is associated with a school of philosophy we call empiricism. In general, the modern philosophy prior to Kant is broken down into two camps. You have the empiricists on the one side, and you have the rationalists on the other side. Um, the empiricists, and we'll take, we'll take um, Mr. Locke as the foremost exponent of this, and this is what I think is most significant here, and it'll be the, the, the starting point for our look at Blake, um, state that the mind is a tabula rasa. That's, that's Locke's famous phrase. Let me see if I can find a quote here. Let us suppose the mind to be, as we say, a tabula rasa, so literally a blank slate. There's nothing on it. When you're born, there's, n there's nothing in it at all. Void of all characters without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence comes it by that vast store which the busy and boundless fancy of man has painted on it? with an almost endless variety. When has it all the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer, in one word, from experience. We gain all of the content of our minds from experience. There's nothing there before. And that includes our moral nature. This is key. It's the starting point for today. We're going to look at Blake's uh, There is no natural religion, and all religions are one, and so forth. And then we'll look on it. But he begins from a Lockean vantage point that there is nothing there until experience fills uh, the mind with associations, which are, which are ideas that it makes from connecting material objects. It, we only get reality from the five senses. So it is a materialist reduction of the world. We get it from seeing things, hearing things, tasting things, smelling things, feeling things. Those are the only means by which we come about our ideas. We put these things together. So I touch something, and it's hot, and I get burnt, and I associate that with pain. So suddenly, uh, heat gets associated with pain as well. So now we make the association, the idea of pain in conjunction with heat comes from the experience of pain. And then the brightness and all, like the myriad of associations with that, like a fire. Don't touch that, it's red hot. So then I, after that I see red and I associate it with heat and also potentially with danger and then all those, but he says we gain that wholly from experience. And the way we unite them then and this is for also important for a Locke, is through a faculty he calls the imagination. So he, he gives great emphasis on the imagination. In, in Locke's philosophy, it is, um, it's obvious and correct to say that he is an empiricist and that he thinks that all of our knowledge comes from the senses. But what unites those discrete experiences and the ideas that comes from it is the imagination. So the imagination plays a huge role in Locke. And not just in Locke, but in the Romantics. It's the word that they appeal to 
over and over. They all appeal to the imagination. And I think they all begin from the starting point that we have no moral nature. which is a direct, uh, indirect conflict with what C.S. Lewis calls the Tao, the great Western tradition of having a moral nature, which is what all the teachers um, from the ancient world onwards will tell us. Now, I don't see Lewis in The Abolition of Man going after Locke, but he should have, actually. He should have gone after his own empiricist British tradition for evacuating ide the idea that we have a moral nature that comes with being human and we, we can see it from early on. Lewis certainly strongly argues it and he says it's the traditional position, but it's not the traditional position for the English or it isn't after Locke. M Milton, who writes before Locke, would certainly have held it, as would Shakespeare, as would all of the English writers to that point. After Locke, we find people that will hold to the moral sense tradition. Uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson will hold strongly to it. So will Jane Austen. But, but we find as many are uh, seduced by lo the Lockean perspective and the romantics begin from the perspective of Locke. And that's why their emphasis is on the imagination is so strong because it's the only thing that unifies a reductionist materialist w science that they see all around them. They want to put the down, they're, they're, they are, in a sense, they are trapped in the same presuppositions as their contemporaries are. Say, so, yes, you're placing the emphasis on the material object, but you've missed the point. You need to focus on the imagination. But they still think that we have no moral nature, which is what their contemporaries do, which is why they're doing all sorts of experiments on the natural world, which some people think are immoral. They're certainly willing to do what Bacon did and to treat nature as a slave, uh, there to do your bidding. We can do with what we will so we can extract more resources out of her. So then the whole of the cosmos and the created order is seen as a material thing that is there for us to, to exploit. The romantics deplore the exploitation. They don't they think it's wrong. However, I think the starting point is still a Lockean one because they don't uphold the sanctity of human nature innately. It begins with innocence, and then it gains ex through experience. But it isn't innately good or innately fallen. So they, they jettison the whole Christian teaching on human nature. Very important. I say that because they're going to move in the direction of sounding like Christians on certain things, but they don't start from the same place. And as a result, they often don't end in the same place. Some of them end closer there and others further away. But they start from Locke's presuppositions. Locke would have called himself a Christian, by the way. And, and, and maybe he was, but his theory, that, and, and this is what I will always say, sometimes people are better than their theories in their own personal lives. And some people are worse than their theories. Some people have great ideas and then in practice, they're, they're terrible human beings and vice versa. Some people have terrible ideas, and but in their private lives, you want that per person with you in the trenches because that's a good man. He's, you know, he, here's what he, his theories are, but in practice, he's got your back. He's not going to betray you. So some people are better than their theories. Some people are worse than their theories. I think that's true to this day. Um, comments or questions about that, but that, I, I think that's an important starting point here is to recognize that there is a sense that we don't have a moral nature. It comes to us through experience. It's not that it's immoral either, it's just blank. 
And depending on our experiences, we become good or bad people. Whereas Christian teaching is that we are fundamentally good because we bear the image of God, and yet that fundamental goodness has been contradicted by sin, so that although we have a sense of goodness in the world and justice in the world, and we appeal to it every time somebody wrongs us, you say, that's wrong, why did you do that? And it doesn't matter if they are Christians and you're a Christian, you'd say it to anybody, that's wrong, and you expect them to know that it's wrong, and more to the point, they do know that it's wrong. That makes no sense if, from a romantic perspective. To say that it's wrong to somebody, they think, well, yes, but they've never experienced goodness, so they couldn't know what justice is. Um, so the romantics start with a very different, and I think a very Lockean position. But unlike the philosophers of the day and the scientists of the day, they're not focused on exploiting the material, they're focused on uh, appealing to the imagination, which has a is almost a redemptive faculty. And it is in Blake. For Blake, the imagination uh, has the capacity to redeem human nature, more or less. He will appeal to it that way. And to some degree, they all do this. Where is this? Oh, no, I don't want that there. Uh, I had a... I had a sticky note in there, and of course I've totally lost it. But the, the, the redemptive faculty of the imagination is such that it takes, so as I say, the experiences come in, um, in atomistic ways. Like there's just an object, I touch it, it's a thing. And then I associate that thing with an idea. So a desk is hard, it's a certain structure, so I, I start to make all sorts of association of ideas. But what unifies the whole of those ideas is the imagination. For the romantics, it then, they push this towards more or less Christian ends. So now the imagination has a unifying ability that Lockean empiricism denied. And they, but then they put that faculty in the mind of the, of the poet. And the, the poets then become uh, godlike in their capacities. Strong emphasis, and you will find this in all liberal thought, the belief that the, um, we need to, people need to be more imaginative and the world's problems will be, will be a lot better if we can be just more imaginative in the way we see things. They don't mean make stuff up. They mean uh, have a greater sense of inclusiveness. You know, you're seeing a division here, and you've done that because you lack imagination. If you had a greater sense of imagination, you would not be dividing what is fundamentally unified. And they'll appeal to it with a sort of a religious awe if you know what I'm talking about here. And you can probably find all sorts of associations. I'm not going to find this. Uh, nope. Um, but, uh, but, but there's a difference between uh, the Romantics' conception of the imagination and, and uh, the 18th century, because although the, uh, in the 18th century, uh, there, there's uh, no sense of um, of redemption associated with the faculty. It's as much dangerous as it is uh, salvific. You can imagine things, and he, he, you can it, it can be fanciful. You can be deluded. Yes, you can have a unifying concept, but the unifying concept can be completely wrong. Well, in the Romantic movement, there is a sense that it it holds on to the truth in a greater way. It's very positive. The faculty is almost never presented in negative terms. So I will, I'll, I'll read from uh, Perkins here. What does he say? In its most general significance, 
Imagination denoted a working of the mind that is total, synthetic, it puts things together, immediate and dynamic. In this sense, the theory of the imagination was a reaction not only against empirical analysis that breaks things apart, but also against the traditional faculty psychology of which the vocabulary at least persisted throughout the 19th century. This psychology, that is the traditional notion of psychology, conceived the mind as exhibiting separate powers or functions. What are those separate functions? Sensation, memory, reason, passions. So these are different faculties. Plato would have said this, right? That there are different faculties, divisions there. They say, no, it's all, it's, there's a unified thing here at work. Um, and I'll skip over that, but you can look at the little bit on the imagination on page 19 if you're interested in that. Let me go to the, uh, there is no natural religion, and then I think you can see, let me get rid of this and this. Uh, is that actually it? Well, there's the first picture. Unblank. There is no natural religion. And you can see an engraving here. There are a whole series of engravings here, I, 11 or 12, in which he makes an argument. And the argument here, I'll start with there is no natural religion, although it prints in our text here, the one is below the other. Uh, there is an argument. Now note this is what Milton does in Paradise Lost. He gives you an argument for it. So, and, and the influence of Milton is there in all of these writers as well. They see the, their enterprise as epic insofar as they are exalting a faculty uh, that Milton employed himself and they do that much more so. So they see themselves as heirs of Milton. And Milton's uh, the great epic poet, the great defender of liberty. Remember, he writes Areopagitica. The, re the great defender of republican government as opposed to the tyranny of monarchy is Mr. Milton. They, ha they see themselves as allies. They can do away with his Christianity because really he's an apostle of the imagination. That's how they conceive of him. And they say, if, you know, if we had written when Milton wrote 150 years ago, we probably would have sounded like Christians as well. But really, that was not essential to his system. The area in which he really flourishes is in the use of his imagination. So there is no natural religion. There is an argument there. Well, what is the argument? Man has no notion of moral fitness but from education. Naturally, he's only a natural organ subject to sense. That sounds like John Locke. So he has no notion of moral fitness. In other words, moral right or moral wrong. He, ha he has no notion of it. When uh, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man deplores the schoolmasters for breaking with this tradition, he could have pointed back 200 years easily. Say it didn't begin, it didn't begin there. They're, they're sound, they sound like Locke's heirs on this front. We only get moral instruction from education, but it, it's not innate to ourself that we are moral beings. As I say, there's a strong sense of um, continuity in the English speaking tradition on this. And I say it coexists alongside of the moral sense tradition that is also there. But the Lockean gains a foothold in academia in his influence over others. The, so Lockean philosophy influences David Hume and his skepticism. And Hume likewise, even though he thinks that religion is nonsense, will still think that the imagination has a moral power to it. And it's an important one. He, he also will talk about the importance of the imagination. So no notion of moral fitness, uh, but from education. 
but from education. Naturally, he's only a natural organ subject to sense. So he's an he's a empiricist. Se firstly, that's the argument. Point one, man cannot naturally perceive but through his natural or bodily organs. Locke. Two, man by his reasoning power can only compare and judge of what he has already perceived. Everything comes through the senses and we make judgments on the basis of prior sensory experience. Not an intuitive sense of right and wrong. Modern psychology would uh, f have findings at odds with this. They note that small children make moral judgments very early on. They appear to at any rate. Babies are offended. I talked about this in a previous class at injustice. They actually go red in the face. It's not just because they want to eat and it's the way they're getting attention. They have to throw you know, a temper tantrum to get it. It's if they see something going on that they think is wrong, they get upset. It might even be skewed by the fact that they haven't had enough to eat and so they're grumpy and cranky and mom's not paying attention to me and she's talking to this stupid man. <laughs> right? And she's going on and on and on and she's ignoring me and I am hungry. This is not right. This is totally wrong. Does she not know who I am? Right? So that, that genuinely angry. It's not just gaining, you know, it's not just being motivated by uh, hunger. There's something more there. And you can see it. They're exhibit like a, there's real temper there. And that's motivated by injustice. It's easier to see once they get to be talking. And then they start saying that you're, that's not fair, that's wrong, and whatever. And then they take it out on each other and <laughs> punch each other. You'll also see babies punch their moms in the nose and stuff like that. And everyone's like, mm. And then it's like, oh, he didn't mean to do that. And like, oh, yes, he did. Yeah. And you're lucky he wasn't very strong because he would have broken your nose. He, did. he hit you as hard as he could. Sweet little lamb. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're not that good. But a sense, so there is a sense even early on of an awareness of good and evil but also uh, the, the capacity for that in the child. They did, they did, like I've seen small kids hit other kids with sticks. And I think if you were stronger, that kid would be dead because you've literally hit them over the head. Anyway, so they are moral agents, just not responsible moral agents. That's not what Lockean psychology teaches. It's all from education. I think, really, who taught the child to do that? They didn't need to see that. Anyway, thirdly, from a perception of only three senses or three elements, none could deduce a fourth or fifth. So it has to be all of them. So these are all discrete areas of sensory perception. So sight and, and hearing and taste have nothing to do with touch and smell. They're, all discrete, they, but, so, and all five are necessary then. Thirdly, fourth, none could have any other than natural or organic thoughts if he had none but organic perceptions. Fifthly, man's desires are limited by his perceptions. None can desire what he has not perceived. C.S. Lewis will respond to this and say, well, how come every religion uh, and every political campaign appeals to us of utopian schemes of heaven. We have no experience of that. Why, do, why are people attracted by that? There's an innate sense of uh, what uh, Calvin calls the sensus divinitatis in us. In us. There's a, a sense of, of uh, being God's creatures, which we suppress in unrighteousness, it says in Romans 1. But it's there. We know that we're not gods, really. And we're certainly not just sensory apparatus like Mr. Locke is contending here. We, we know more. We know better than the philosophers on this. Sixthly, the desires and perceptions of man untaught by anything but organs of sense must be limited to objects of sense. Conclusion. So based on all of everything that he's argued to this point, so we're all, it's all just sensory perception. And yet, there's more than that. 
what do we attribute that to? So it's not just sensory. We, we, there are a lot of other things that are not to be reduced to those things. The conclusion, if it were not for the poetic or prophetic character, the philosophic and experimental would soon be at, at the ratio of all things and stand still, unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over again. We, there would be no sense of unity or purpose or meaning. It all comes from the poetic character. Where does the poetic character come from? I have no idea. Poetic or prophetic character. He places huge emphasis on this in response to the empiricism of Locke, which he takes as given that this is the correct way of looking at things. And here's, there's the problem, here's my solution. So I think he's speaking against Locke, but at the same time accepting the presuppositions of Locke. That's the problem. What if Locke was wrong from the beginning? Doesn't enter his mind. So such is the stranglehold of Locke and Hume and the empiricist philosophers over British uh, intellectual life that I think they always begin on the wrong foot if they're coming from that camp. There are English writers that are from the moral sense tradition uh, that are going to strongly disagree with Locke and, and Hume and so forth. But, but the dominant strain we associate with the period is, is that of empiricism. Um, all religions are one. Now he presents himself, remember he just said poetic or prophetic character. Look at the first line, the argument, once again very Miltonic, the argument as the true method, as the true method of knowledge, oh, it's, it says all religions are one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Well, who's, who do we associate that with? John the Baptist, right? So he has a, he is an angry prophet of, so uh, railing against what? What is John the Baptist calling people to do? <coughs> to repent. Is he, what, is he calling him to repent for contradicting the Torah and for treating people with injustice? No, but, that, but he sees himself in that vein against a way of looking at the world. So now the enemy is not sin. That's not the, the focus. The, the focus is a wrong way of looking at the world. The solution is a right way of looking at the world. So it's wholly intellectual. And it doesn't see the moral problem, really. The moral um, is only in the sense that this is the right way. Right is a moral assessment. So the argument, as the true method of knowledge is experiment, the true faculty of knowing must be the faculty which experiences. This faculty I treat of, principle one that the poetic genius is the true man and that the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius. Likewise, that the forms of all things are derived from their genius, which by the ancients we called an angel and spirit and demon. Okay, so there's a lot going on here and it's very muddled. However, what in the ancient world we associate with supernatural beings, Blake here is psychologizing and saying their expression of, of personal character, their, ex, their extensions of other people. We call it an angel. There is no such thing as an angel unto itself. But there is such a thing as an angel in an imaginative sense. It's very real. And Blake uh, will have angels populating his whole poetic corpus but he doesn't actually believe in the objective entity of an angel. But he does believe in a spiritual world. In fact, he sees the spiritual world all around him. What's the difference between an angel and a demon? One's good, the other's bad, pretty much. Um, although in, in uh, others like Shelley will make something of this uh, in 
Plato, uh, Socrates will sometimes consult his demon. And he's not referring to a, a diabolical character. He's referring to a sort of a, a spirit within him which is telling him what to do, as, as a tutelary spirit. It's hard. Christian theology pushes a demon and associates it with fallen angels and so forth, right? I don't think that's what Socrates is. Some people might think he is. I don't know. It gets a little sketchy here. But that's not what he means by this. It's daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N. It's not what we say in English as a demon. That's from scripture. Daimon exists before that in, in Greek writing and seems to be uh, almost maybe like his conscience, something that's guiding him. He hears a voice. Uh, Blake conflates all of these, angel, spirit, and demon. They're all something that can't be reduced to the five senses. So I'll, I'll read it again. First principle, that the poetic genius is the true man, unlike the physical man, the true man, and that the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius. So our physical being is exp an expression of our inner being. Likewise, that the forms of all things are derived from their genius, which by the ancients was called an angel and spirit and demon. So the spiritual precedes the physical in some ways, and it, or expresses it outwardly. Principle two, as all men are alike in outward form, so, and with the same infinite variety, all are alike in the poetic genius. Like this becomes hard to follow, I think. Anyway, principle three, no man can write think or write, sorry, no man can think, write, or speak from his heart, but he must intend truth. He must intend truth. Note that he must not act in accordance with truth. He must not uh, acknowledge truth. He must intend it. No man can think, write, or speak from his heart but he must intend truth. Why? Because the heart's a blank slate and is fundamentally good. And if he expresses from the heart, then he intends goodness. Thus, all sects of philosophy are from the poetic genius adapted to the weakness of every individual. For as none but traveling over known lands can find out the unknown, so from already acquired knowledge man could not acquire more. Therefore, an universal poetic genius exists He's a terrible logician. But anyway, five, the religions of all nations are derived from each nation's different reception of the poetic genius, which is everywhere called the spirit of prophecy. Six, the Jewish and Christian testaments are an original derivation from the poetic genius. This is necessary from the confined nature of bodily sensation. So he, uh, he posits a particular imagination, imaginative vitality to scripture. It's really interesting. So as, as heterodox as Blake sounds on some things, he thinks that the Bible is the living power of God. And he regularly appeals to it as um, the living edicts of the imagination, as the great code of Western art. Uh, Northrop Fry, the great Canadian scholar of Blake, calls his treatment of the Bible as literature, the great code, he takes it directly from Blake. So he sees the Bible as providing a sort of a template that helps us to understand all creativity. Here's fundamental creativity. So he has a high view of scripture in a way. It's not a Christian view of scripture, but it still attributes a great deal to it. And you'll see that Blake's images are derived significantly from scripture. If you want more works, more work on this, uh, let me put this back on. There are writers that have uh, looked into this a, a fair bit. Um, not Abrams' Natural Supernatural, although that's a fantastic work. Um, I'm thinking of. And not angle. Angle is uh, sees things from a different. Stephen Prickett is very good. 
the origins of narrative, the romantic appropriation of the Bible. He talks about how the biblical images, characters, whatever, are appropriated by the romantics and used for non-biblical ends, but they're still, it, it, the, the, it's the air they breathe, it's the great code for them. It's, it's, Prickett's a good guide on this. So that's what I wanted to show you there. Stephen Prickett. Uh, note that one of his books there was uh, also Romanticism and Religion. Very interesting discussion of how the two early and uh, f foundational romantics um, are received in the Victorian church as holding on to the Christian faith. So the Anglicanism in the early 19th century was on its death's door. and. Uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge were seen to be speaking to the spiritual side of human nature and the, uh, in a way that appealed to people strongly and had a, had a powerful movement there. But here we're talking about Blake. Anyway, but so principle six, the Jewish and Christian Testaments are an original derivation from the poetic genius. This is necessary from the confined nature of bodily sensation. Seventh, as all men are alike, though infinitely various, so all religions and as all similars have one source. Again, the logic is terrible. Um, but the true man is the source, he being the poetic genius. Whatever you take from it, he places a high emphasis on, poet, on the poetic imagination and the poetic genius. A great deal of emphasis. So. Um, it's helpful, as, as incoherent as that is in certain respects, to recognize the importance of the, uh, the genius cult of the 18th century and the 19th century of the Romantic period. The appeal to a genius who's going to lead us forward, who sees more because he has a greater imagination, a greater sense of vitality, a sense that unifies us all, is so strong in the period that it's hard to underestimate, or to overstate, rather. And it gets particularly associated with certain types of individuals. And uh, they will particularly like the childhood prodigy, like Mozart. But they will also particularly favor um, bards from pre-rational cultures. Uh, and, and even pre-literate cultures. So oral poetry takes on much greater significance in this period. It's revered. It has not been debased by the experiences of civilization and twisted and distorted. Human nature is expressed uh, vividly there. And they will, they, they will even uh, appeal to the Bible as an illustration of this and say that the, the, the Psalms are great poetry that retains its vitality to this very day, largely because they were not yet really civilized in the modern sense. And they didn't follow, the, they don't follow the, any rules. They don't follow Greco-Roman conventions for poetry. They're, they're closer to nature. They are closer to their innate feelings. They haven't followed conventions of others. They express from the heart. And it, of course it's a religious text. That's because it's an imaginative text, don't you see? Uh, questions or comments? I want to go to the uh, Songs of Innocence, but before, yes, uh, either of you. Okay, Jordan, you first. In some way, I mean, he sounds a lot like Keats, right? Um, I think he thinks that the imaginative is more real than the material. Does he take that as like just the first principle? Pretty much, true? pretty much. On the basis of Lockean philosophy and the emphasis here, and think, yeah, well, if, if it really is just material, 
then there's, there's nothing there. It's, it, so it's the later consequence of Lockean philosophy that what unites them all is the imagination. Say, so, yeah, well, Locke is entirely correct. This is entirely reductionistic, but the imagination is the opposite. It is not reductionistic. It's the opposite. It pulls everything together. It's the, it's the unifying force. It can't be reduced to sensory experience because it unifies everything, and nobody has an all-inclusive unifying experience. What expresses that are what we call religions. They express a unifying social dynamic, and uh, they all have the same source. So we can ignore the, the distinctions between the religions and appeal to what lies behind them all, which is a great imaginative mind. The mind of Moses, the poetry of Jesus. When we come to Shelley, we'll look at, in his defense of poetry, he will throw Jesus alongside Socrates. They're both geniuses. So he doesn't deplore Jesus. He thinks Jesus is, it, his teaching is terrific because he was, he was possessed of a great imagination. And he expressed himself in vital, earthy, expressive forms and people would gravitate. So they start reading themselves into every text, every, and it doesn't matter whether they're a philosopher, a religious faker, figure, a lawgiver, a politician, everybody good and great ever, the one faculty they had is the imagination, just like the Romantics, as it turns out. Yes. Yes. I kind of <laughs> wonder why. Is the blank slate. Impressed upon whatever. So, how would he like define what truth would guide? I don't think he ever defines truth. It's the intention of truth. It's, it's, he intends good. He intends to say something that is valid, correct, whatever. But he, doesn't, he never doesn't come up with a definition of truth. Okay. <laughs> That's. Uh, agreed. Okay. What he states as principles don't, don't logically follow from one another. Yeah. Okay, but even as principles, what exactly do you mean by this? Yeah, to know. intend truth. Well, what is truth then? Mm -hmm. it, you know, at least you would think it's a reasonable question. And, and the importance seems to be that he's speaking from his heart. But if his heart is not innately good? No, it's, it's, it's okay. for, based on what he says earlier from there is no natural religion. Man has no notion of moral fitness but from education. Naturally, he's only a natural organ subject to sense. So how did the heart get a sense of anything other than blankness in it? I don't know. I guess you get it from education, but again, the educate. So where, does the ed where do the educators get it from? They get it from the imagination. So the people possessed of the greatest imagination becomes the, become the educators of humanity. And they then pass that on through the school system and so forth. But they're possessed of one mind, as it were. And the greatest educators have the greatest imagination. Okay. And if you perceive distance, different, yeah, so they get it from outside of themselves, from other people's imagination, from being taught. So you think these are prophecies of Jesus and things like that? Yep. They will regularly, and they will regularly, in this period, I will tell you, the comparison of Jesus and Socrates is, is not uncommon. And what they have in common is they never write anything down. They're famous for their teaching. They're famous for their character. But they're not famous for their writing because they don't write. They didn't want to start a school of philosophy or a school of religion. They cared about people. And, and so they loved Jesus and they loved Socrates. Everybody loves Jesus, including the Romantics. I mean, they don't read Jesus the way anybody else would have read Jesus or understood him in the day, but they still see him. They're trying to hold on to the greatness of Jesus in a, and, and yet unify it with those that Jesus would deplore, probably. So what's the chief sin of the Pharisees? They lack imagination. They become legalistic. 
They, uh, uh, they insist on, on codifications, on laws and rules. And the rules divide things. If they really understood Jesus, they wouldn't appeal to laws and codes. They would appeal to the unifying sense of, are you going to cast the first stone here? No, because you recognize that, that you too are a sinner. That's a great imaginative move by Jesus there. He will go to people, the lepers and the outcasts, the blind, whatever, people that are on the margins of society, and he will treat them as one with him. That's because he had a terrific imagination. Right? That's a way of explaining his character. Yeah, and that's how they see him. And you can see why they would say that. I don't think it's a, it's uh, entirely plausible, but it's the go-all, all-explanatory power that unifies everything. And w when we come to Shelley's defense of poetry, you will see that he does exactly that. He will, he will laud Moses, he will laud Jesus, he will laud Plato, um, pretty much everyone that you would laud, and say that it was the what they had in common was the imagination. And they expressed it in their age, and it burnt like a fire, a burning coal, and then it started to cool off and get dark and lose its coolness. And so what we need is more imagination to blow the sacred flame on the coals to relight things. But we can't appeal to the old coals of a previous generation because that is the, the, the dead letter where we need this, the living spirit. You say it's quasi-Christian language used everywhere by the Romantics. So Christian vocabulary in a Lockean universe. It's trying to fix the problems it perceives in the Enlightenment, but I think by accepting the presuppositions of the Enlightenment, they simply perpetuate the same errors and they just come to an opposite conclusion. So instead of being rationalist, we'll be imaginative. Does that escape the problem? No. Both of them deny original sin. Both of them deny that we're, we fundamentally have a moral nature. This is not a small problem. This is a serious categorical A1 error. Denied, I say original sin is the only empirical, empirically verifiable tenet of the Christian faith. It explains everything. I mean, why do people do bad things? Because they're sinners. Everyone can see that people sin. Wait, oh, I don't like that term. Oh, they do a bad thing? Yeah, okay. I, I call that sin. You just, they do a bad thing. Let's just stick with that. Okay, why do they do a bad thing? Well, because bad things were done to them. Sometimes that's true. But that, why did that person do that bad thing? You push it down eventually. Well, where did the bad begin? And they have no explanation for it, really. It's bad teaching. Just correct the bad teaching. Uh, it's not enough to say that um, we sin, we have to say that we're sinners. It's a benefit, like we, the reason we sin is because we're sinners. That's what they never want to say. They don't even want to use the word, but they never want to assert that we are sinners. They will always agree that moral badness exists. But why does it exist? It's because of bad experiences. And so we need to get the root to the root causes of crime. Now I'm talking like the political left. To get to the root causes of crime, we have to give people food, shelter, clothing, love, Maslow's hierarchy, we fulfill all those things, and then society will be better. And if somebody does something bad, it's because there's, there's something that happened to them, but it's not their fault. Because they're a blank slate, don't you know, fundamentally. It's, they've been imprinted by other people around them. I think that's a very shallow conception of this. It's just not, it's not adequate to the evidence, in my opinion. Like sometimes when I do something wrong, I will blame the person, well, it's because you said this, or you did this. And sometimes it's true, there is some, but it's not sufficient. And it certainly doesn't co cause all, cover all of the re situations in which I've done something which is wrong. I, that's not 
because something happened to me. Although I can always search back far enough. Well, it's because, um, I don't know. My mother loved my sister more. And that's why. If she had loved me more, then I wouldn't have done that. Like, poor mom is getting the blame for, you know, my action here because it's deep, 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 deep. And so psychology, Freud, whatever, will dig, dig deep back in your past and try and correct that because, again, he's a lock-in. Got to fix the education process. And we have to replace it with a, a better imaginative one. It's the same thing over and over from different vantage points. Uh, there was another question. Yes? They are. Okay. Yeah, they are. Um, yes. The romantics are heretical. Okay. Yeah. They deny original sin. You can't, you, if there's no original sin, uh, then there's, nothing, there's no need for salvation. You don't need a savior if there's no sin. Or if sin's just a superficial thing. You could avoid it potentially. Is sin connected with, our, do we inherit Adam's original sin? Are we sinners? Be, so here's the question. Um, are we sinners because we sin? Or do we sin because we're sinners? There's a way to put it. It's very, it's very neat. And it's, uh, it sounds like the exact same thing, except it isn't. Because if we say, are we sinners because we sin? You say, yes. Okay. But so if I don't sin, then I'm not a sinner. Yes. But in the second case, or do we sin because we're sinners? And the answer is yes. So you need to hold on to the second category. Both are true, by the way. But one is necessary, and that's the latter. The reason we have sin is because we're sinners. And we can't avoid it. can't. And then the, use, the appeal to the imagination of the way of doing it is just a way of another form of sin, which rejects, again, core Christian doctrine and teaching on human nature, which is not to say when we say we have original sin or the doctrine of total depravity, it doesn't mean that we're as bad as we ever could possibly be, but that sin accompanies every action and thought that is part of us. It's just there. Sometimes we don't act upon it, but it's still a little bit, like I put things out. People that were offended by the way I spoke. Did I mean what they heard me to say? No and yes. There's a little bit of, a little bit of motivation. You know, I was angry. You know, there's I'm just, just like passive aggressive getting in there. there yeah. And I can logically defend what I said, but I just, all I said was this. My kids do it all the time. I, d I said this, I didn't say that. And everybody in the room knows that the person who said it was trying to needle. I, but I didn't say that, that's, you brought that, and that's your fault, it's your response to that. Everybody there knows that the person who said it meant more than what they said, but they're defending it logically. What's wrong with you, right? We, I'm, not, I'm not accusing of anyone else of doing this. I do this. My kids do it. Everyone does this. That's what I'm saying. There's always a little bit of sin in the intention there. Whereas Blake says, if it comes from the heart, then it must intend truth. Denies that the heart is desperately wicked. So it's a denial of um, the one of the fundamental tenets of human uh, nature, namely that it is fallen. When Adam falls, we all fall with him. He is the federal head of humanity. The good news is that Jesus comes into the world to save sinners. And we, if, if we say that we're sinners, then that's good because we have a Savior who came for sinners. Not for people who sin. He never says that. Although everybody who sins is a sinner, but he comes to save the sinners. So if you don't want to say, but I'm not a sinner, then I'm not here for you. That's not good for you, however. 
you have to acknowledge, first of all, that you are that. And as soon as you can say, then you're saying something true about yourself. You don't want to hear it, but there you go. Blake denies that. And it, it is because he's, uh, I think, misled by, by Locke. Or he's using Lockean language. And the solution to the Lockean problem is a, an emphasis on Locke that Locke himself doesn't make on the imagination and its redemptive capacities. So that's, I can't blame Locke for that, that but, but they get that from their Lockean presuppositions, which Hume doesn't get, ri get rid of. He just perpetuates them. He's still an empiricist. But they will become, but the Romantic writers are almost all uh, spiritual, we would say. They are really talking about the importance of having a spiritual awareness of the unifying aspect of all of life. And that is true of, of religion. It does do this. It unifies things. It gives it a purpose. You can even appeal to the motive of love. Shelley, who is an anti, uh, by his own expression, he's an atheist. Uh, the term love in Shelley is huge. He thinks it's the most important human uh, capacity. Sounds awfully Christian. I mean, it isn't, but it's it's he's recognizing the importance of a of a category there, and so this is one of the problems in the period is when people use terms and use Christian language, and sometimes, um, even in this case, uh, voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Christian allusions, you can be convinced actually this is just Christianity adapted to a modern age. I don't think so. But I think if I said this in an academic uh, conference, I would get slain. But I have done so, and I survived, so. What you do is you, you just are reasonable. I mean, I don't know now what would happen, but I, I've said these sorts of things in, in public. Um, I think I'm going to leave in innocence and experience to the next time because I don't want to just introduce it. But you can already see where it's coming from based on what we said right at the beginning. This is why I took these first two texts there. State of innocence is the blank slateness of things. Experience is what comes from sensory experience and, and teaching. But the one follows the other. You cannot remain in a state of innocence. But the, but the, uh, the appeal to innocence is a very romantic one. So people talk about children being innocent. What do they mean by that? It's a very, like, it's an important question to ask. People use terms and they don't always, they're not always clear what they intend by that term. I would say children are innocent as well. Uh, the ancient world called children innocence as well. In fact, when, you know, when the children are slaughtered by Herod, it's called the massacre of the innocents. How come? It, the Latin word is that they, they don't harm anyone. They knocker is to, the verb to harm. And an innocent is somebody who can't harm anyone. As I say, the baby punch you in the nose. It doesn't, you know, ouch. But they re not, they're, they're harmless. It's not making a statement on the state of their souls. But you could think it was. Every time uh, somebody shooter in the United States goes and you know goes around shooting people up, there's this collective soul searching, and people say, "Where do we lose our innocence?" They, they, the, the press says this. There was a certain time in America's history when we lost our innocence. What a strange way of, of framing that. It's not a Christian way of framing it. It is, however, a romantic way of framing it. And I think the Enlightenment and the Romantic movement are most strong in North America, more so than anywhere else, more so than Europe. Oops, yanked that right off. Uh, Disney would not exist in Europe without the Americans. It's sort of the idealization of innocence. Seems a little odd. 
you meet adult women who talk like Disney princesses with a high squeaky voice as an ideal. Sorry, <laughs> hope nobody has a high squeaky voice. <laughs> but there's a sort of like, is that your real voice? Nobody talks like that, do they? And it's a sort of a persona. You want to be innocent. In what sense? In a projected sense as your ideal. It's a strange uh, thing. If you know what I'm talking about, you may, you know, the idea of putting five-year-olds on stage in dresses and doing beauty pageants with the kids and they, beautiful and innocent and all that, this sort of idealization of, of something there, very sweet and um, I think it's, it, that flows from the, the Enlightenment and particularly from the Romantic period. It's a st strange, disnified version of it, like Barbie, but I don't, don't, don't get me down the Barbie <laughs> path, which I have not seen, by the way. Um, but uh, anyway, I th enough, start saying silly things. Next time we'll look at song of in Songs of Innocence and Experience, and uh, I'll see you then. Okay? And stop that.